Welcome everyone to Alternative Career Path for MBA students. For those of you who don't know who we are, GBSN is a network of leading business schools. We're working to improve management and business education in developing countries. We do this through programs, networking, and events. We are 51 member schools from all over the world, and we represent 26 countries. One of our events that you might be interested in is our MBA Challenge video contest. Uh, these are videos uh, that MBA students prepare showing the creative work they're doing in the developing world. Uh, these are due by March 31st. Um, you can also go online and re review the videos and also cast your vote. Uh, the winning team will win a trip to our um, conference in New Delhi, India to present the video. And welcome everyone. My name is Lisa Leander. I'm the membership officer with the Global Business School Network. Uh, today I'm very pleased to have panelists with us representing various firms working to make an impact in the world. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Phyllis Puyat Thibodeau, the Associate Director for MBA Career and Professional Programs from the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland in College Park. Thank you, Phyllis, for joining us today. Hi, Lisa, and welcome to all of you from around the world. I know you represent a huge diversity of interests and backgrounds and uh, while sharing also the challenge of becoming next generation leaders in a changing economy. Um, for myself, I, I can share with you that um, I've been working with students at varied universities over um, 25 years and in the last five, specifically with MBAs. Um, and, and that includes about a thousand students in the Washington DC area, Maryland, but also um, from around the world. And they are studying part-time evenings and weekends, um, taking an alternative approach. And um, they are working in government, nonprofit, commercial, um, and even in education. Um, the thing that I can share is that consistently students and professionals really bring a common theme, that they are seeking to combine meaning making and making a difference as well as uh, achieving the traditional title and pay. Um, many of them do continue to pursue finance and marketing, consulting, organizational strategy, but um, what I notice is that there is an entrepreneurial spirit that is emerging and I call it next generation leadership. Um, and this is important because our companies are faced with retiring workers um, and, and change is the constant across all sectors. They are requiring um, skill, innovation, and a global view that uh, I think you represent, um, having grown up with the technologies and more access to travel and so forth. Um, but the challenge is to redesign how we do business, to integrate the values of social concern, environmental stewardship, as well as the operational effectiveness that can bring the sustainable profit uh, so we're all on a learning curve, and I uh, love uh, the Global Business School Network's uh, emphasis on bringing your MBA mind, your philanthropic heart, and your adventurous spirit. So uh, with that, um, this is a really exciting event today because these are uh, wonderful panelists who have been actively making this idea work. They share uh, their, they'll be here to share their experiences practices and advice um, that I hope you can use on your own career path. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, uh, as they are sharing, please feel free to post your questions and I'll be uh, paying attention to them. And uh, at the end of the sessions, we will um, be gathering those questions and posing those to our panelists. So please stay tuned even after the presentations are completed. We're going to start with uh, Dan Zook, who is our project leader at Dahlberg, which is a strategic advisory firm working to raise the standards of living in developing countries with impact across four continents. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Phyllis. Glad to be here. And thank you to GBSN for uh, sponsoring this event. I'm just going to try and go in a slideshow view here so you can all see. Great. Uh, uh, as Phyllis said, I'm a project leader with Dahlberg Global Development Advisors, and I'm based in the, the New York office. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about three things. First, I'll just talk to you a little bit about Dahlberg and who we are and what we do, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my story and how I ended up at, at Dahlberg. 
And then finally, I'll just offer some, some reflections on things that I thought about and things that I learned while I was uh, developing my career and getting to where I wanted to be. So let me start by telling you a little bit about, about Dahlberg. Uh, Dahlberg is a consulting firm. It's a mission-driven organization, and our mission is to mobilize effective responses to the world's most pressing issues, particularly in uh, issues that affect people in developing countries. Uh, so like I said, we're, we're a mission-driven organization. We are a for-profit uh, business, but uh, we're, you could really classify us as a social enterprise because we're very mission-driven, and we've created a, a business model that allows our consulting services to be accessible to the public, private, and uh, non-government sectors. All of our staff, or most of our staff, have, have come from a background from one of the top-tier management consulting firms, and they combine that experience with uh, with a lot of time on the ground in developing countries and understanding uh, issues that affect people uh, in those in those markets. Just as an example of some of the clients we work with, uh, they fall into three main categories. We, we do a lot of work with the public sector, organizations like the IFC, World Bank, uh, bilateral aid agencies, and, and uh, foreign governments. We also do a lot of work with NGOs and foundations, such as Mercy Corps or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then finally, we work with uh, a lot of for-profit corporations and investors. Uh, in particular, we do a lot of work with the natural resources sectors, mining and oil, and uh, also with pharmaceuticals and financial services companies. And in total, we've done more than 600 engagements since our founding 10 years ago. And that's with uh, over 200 organizations. And we have a pretty good retention rate. We find 75% uh, of our clients uh, are, are retaining us and, and using our services again. We have a global presence, uh, currently 11 offices around the world, spread across North, Af North America, South America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. Uh, we're expanding further and further into Asia. We've been opening offices at the rate of uh, uh, at least one a year, if not two, and, and we're planning to continue that, that trajectory. So just a little bit about what we, what we bring in our projects. Uh, like I said, we, we're all management consultants. We've all worked from the top firms. And we bring that management consulting approach, which starts with the structured problem solving and you know, generating hypothesis trees and, and question trees uh, and, and a logical flow to the project. We combine that with a, a fact-based analysis. We do very deep research, collect a lot of data, a very rigorous analysis on the, the issues that we're, we're working on. We combine that then with the technical expertise and experience of our staff. We have uh, 12, 12, um, uh, 12 sectors or 12 um, practice areas, uh, similar to, to your typical management consulting firms, but a, a slightly different spin on our practices. We have things like access to finance, uh, education, energy and environment, um, ICT and mobile, mobile technologies for development, just as an example of some of the, the expertise. And our, our partners tend to align to uh, one or more of these areas, and then our staff will work across many of these areas. And as they, as they grow in the firm, they tend to specialize in, uh, into a cluster of these, uh, these areas. Finally, we bring organizational knowledge. We've done a lot of work with all of the major um, organizations in the international development sphere. The, we know the UN very well. We know the World Bank. We know the bilaterals. And so we bring that knowledge of all the different actors. And we also, since we come from traditional management consulting backgrounds, we know the for-profit companies as well, and we understand their thinking. And what we're really good at doing is translating the, the, um, the, the incentives and, and, the, and the, um, the missions of these different organizations and helping them uh, communicate with one another. So let me just give you an example of the types of projects we do. We've, we've worked all over the world, as I said. Uh, for example, we did a project in Haiti uh, shortly after the earthquake uh, in Haiti, uh, the U.S. government engaged us to help them develop a, a long-term reconstruction strategy, uh, uh, helping the U.S. government decide where they would allocate their funds uh, across many sectors. Uh, this included rebuilding energy infrastructure. This included rebuilding health infrastructure. Uh, it included helping the country get on a path towards uh, food security and, and economic growth. Uh, another example of a project we've done was in Venezuela, where we worked with a, a global pharmaceutical company to look at how they could increase profitable growth in the base of the pyramid market. Uh, we've done a lot of work in, in Africa. For example, in Botswana, we helped a, a, a U.S. government agency to create a, a new fund, an investment fund, that would focus on African social investments. Also, we've, we did a project in, in West Africa with the, the World Bank related to uh, creating a, a governance framework uh, to increase transparency in the mining sector. 
So I'm sure the question on a, on a lot of your minds when you're MBAs and, and you're looking for a job as you come out, you want to know what you know what organizations like Dahlberg are looking for. These are the five the five main things that Dahlberg are looking for. Number one, as I said, most of our staff have experience with a professional services uh, uh, management consulting firm. So that may be McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Booz, Monitor, Accenture, um, all of the top firms. Uh, people have usually done at least two, if not four or five or more years uh, of experience at one of those firms. Secondly, all of our staff have experience uh, living, studying, or working in a de developing country. Uh, third, most of our staff have credentials from one of the top universities, uh, often uh, an MBA program at the more senior level or a, or a joint MBA and uh, policy degree. Um, fourth, we, we really look for an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, we're, we're a small firm still. We're about 120 people now worldwide. Uh, but with 11 offices, that means each of our offices is quite small, and we don't have the same support infrastructure that you would get at a big traditional management consulting firm. So we're, we're looking for people that can really get their hands dirty and dive in and help us build a firm and are going to create new ideas and, and take ownership of things. And finally, very importantly, we're looking for people who really care about our mission, people who have a long-term commitment to raising living standards around the world and want to use their business expertise to, to further, further this mission. And I should add that we, we are hiring at the moment. You can, you can find out about opportunities at Dahlberg through our website. Uh, we've finished most of our recruiting in the United States for the year. Uh, so the opportunities that are open at the moment are mostly overseas, but you can find a number of opportunities. And it, it changes from time to time. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check our website and see, uh, see what's open. So I'm going to change tack a little bit and just offer a personal reflection about how I got to Dahlberg and, and my path. And of course, there are many paths to, to, to get here, uh, but just offer you a personal reflection of, of uh, what mine was. I started out out of undergrad. I did a program called Princeton in Asia, which was a fellowship program that placed me uh, with a organization in Vietnam. Uh, it's a global organization called PLAN. Uh, it's an NGO focused on uh, children. And I worked for PLAN for a couple of years, helping them start a microfinance program in Vietnam. That got me very interested in the power of business to have impact on poverty. And so I decided to pursue that interest further and, and uh, have, get an MBA at Cornell University, where I focused in sustainable global enterprise and had the opportunity to do a number of interesting projects that combined business and international development, including a project I did in uh, South Africa with a company called CapeSpan, uh, helping them uh, evaluate a fair trade fruit label that, that they had developed. I did also I took the opportunity to do a semester abroad in Hong Kong, which was a great opportunity. I did my final semester of business school there, and I wanted to go back and work in Asia. So going to Hong Kong was a, was a great way to just get on the ground, start talking to companies, uh, look around at different leads, and also to expand my network and meet students from uh, uh, not just from Hong Kong, but from, from all over the world, because many people come uh, to study in Hong Kong. So that was great for expanding my network and, uh, and awareness of, of the region. I was hoping to get a job uh, in Asia. Uh, when I graduated, I actually did a short fellowship uh, sponsored by Cornell with a company called Freeplay that had developed a distributed energy device. And they wanted to do an evaluation of, this, uh, of a micro-franchising uh, uh, micro model they had in Rwanda. Uh, so I helped them with that in order to, that they could access more money from the, the World Bank. Uh, at that time, I had received an offer for a full-time job from Standard Chartered Bank, but uh, not in, in Asia. They'd actually asked me to go to Dubai because the Middle East, this was 2007, and the Middle East was just was booming. Uh, so I, I decided that could be a fun adventure, a good way to learn about a new region. So I joined Standard Chartered Bank based in Dubai. I did that for about a year, and then I swapped over to consulting and joined Booz & Company in the financial services practice. I spent two years with Booz in Dubai traveling around the region, uh, building banks, helping banks expand across borders. And that was a great experience to learn about how, uh, how business really works in these, these really emerging, really frontier markets. I worked in some you know, places like uh, um, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Libya, Syria, uh, really some, some very different, very interesting markets. Uh, I transferred with Booz back to the US, and then shortly thereafter, I joined Dahlberg, uh, where I was able to finally combine my passion for international development with the, the business acumen that I developed over the previous years. And so now I'm based with uh, Dahlberg in, in New York. So through all that process, I think you know, there are a lot of things I thought about, and there are a few things that I learned. I think you know, when, you're, when you're figuring out which way you want to go, a good way to start is, is to pick an industry that you're passionate about. Um, 
and there's there's many different ways that you can you can go. You can you can go through a social enterprise type of model like a Dahlberg or Acumen, LGT, Clinton Global Initiative, Gates Foundation. You know, all of these organizations look for for MBAs, uh, but there's a limited number of roles there, and they often look for people who have both the the uh, 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 professional experience in the corporate sector and also nonprofit experience. So if you don't have, if you haven't developed all of that yet, you might want to consider a more mainstream job in like finance or consulting. I know finance gets a, a, a bad rap a lot amongst a lot of uh, socially responsible folks these days, but you know access to finance in emerging markets has had a huge impact on the growth of these markets, and in fact, it's it's made it so that the World Bank has to rethink the way they operate. So. Finance can, can be a great tool uh, for development. And consulting, likewise, helping companies expand in some of these, these markets. You learn a lot, uh, a lot of great tools, and, and you can have a lot of impact. A lot of consulting firms actually do um, uh, development work on the side. You know, McKinsey and Monitor, in particular, come to mind. In fact, we find ourselves competing with them quite directly for, for our projects at Dahlberg. Um, you can also go to a multinational corporation. And, and if you do that, think about a multinational corporation that you really admire, that's one that's addressing an, an issue that you're passionate about. If you're interested in agriculture, consider working for a, you know, an agriculture company. If you're interested in water or energy, consider working for a company that's involved in that space. And once you're within those companies, you can try and work your way across to, to focus on those issues directly. But in the meantime, you'll be learning about how those companies operate, what their incentives are. Finally, startups are always a great option. If you've got the entrepreneurial spirit, social enterprise is, is awesome. You know, it's, it's high risk, but it's high reward, and you, you can really have a lot of impact if, if, you've, uh, if you really want to go for that. So the next step is I, I found it very helpful to just make a list. I was just constantly compiling lists of companies that I found interesting. And when I found those companies, then I would check my network. I would talk to people who I knew, who I knew at those companies or friends of friends of those companies. And sometimes I would just write to HR and ask them if they had jobs. Uh, one of the job opportunities I ended up with was a, a commodity supply chain um, manager in Hong Kong, and I just wrote to HR and, and, um, and uh, ended up with an offer there. And networking, I can't stress how important networking is. It's a, it's a small world, so you want to use your network and try and meet people in areas you're interested in, talk to your alumni, attend uh, networking events, try and get on distribution lists. And finally, um, you sh can consider fellowships or grants. When I did the project in Rwanda, that was actually financed through a, a grant from Cornell University. There's also great programs like the Acumen Fellows, uh, Kiva Fellows, LGTI Cats, Echoing Green, MBA Enterprise Corps, all these organizations that will place you in, in interesting roles. I'll just talk a little bit about how you can use your MBA program to, uh, to get a head start. First of all, in your classes, you want to build your core business skills, but you should also look at international business classes that you can take. And I also really encourage you to look at classes that are outside the MBA. You know, if you're interested in public policy, maybe go take a, a class in the public policy school. Uh, similar with energy, maybe there's a class in the engineering school on sustainable energy. It's also really good to try and take project opportunities. Uh, MBA programs are great at pairing you up with companies overseas to do short-term consulting projects. And oftentimes, you can incorporate social enterprise uh, into those projects. Clubs are great. Uh, obviously, GBSN is, is a great opportunity to network. Regional clubs are good. If you're interested in consulting, you definitely want to do your consulting club and get good at doing case interviews. And then Net Impact and other impact-oriented business clubs are a great way to get perspective and build your network. And finally, if you have the opportunity to, to study abroad, uh, I found that opportunity really helpful. Um, I also, if, if, you, if you can't do, commit to a whole semester, you could just do a short-term job trek or a study tour. That can also be um, a helpful way to uh, to build experience. Just a couple of other perspectives. Uh, one is you really want to stay on top of the issues. You want to be informed. If you want to work in the international development space, you need to understand what's what's driving the issues. I find the Economist a great way to stay on top of things, just digest all the, the key things happening around the world. And a little shameless self-promotion, uh, Dahlberg has a blog uh, that talks about the issues we're interested in. And finally, think about language. If you've got a language, use it. You know, Think about regions where you can you can work there. If you don't have a language, then think about what regions and industries are going to be the best fit. If you don't speak Chinese, it's pretty hard to work in China. Uh, similarly, if you don't speak Spanish, pretty hard to work in, in Latin America, Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, but other places will be, be more accommodating, and industries as well. Finance, for example, is, is generally done in English no matter where you go. But consulting, you probably need to know a bit of the language in order to really get into a company and, and um, make a change. So I'll just wrap up with a couple of questions that I found myself asking uh, when I was 
thinking about where I was going to go. One thing is to ask yourself, what are you most passionate about? What issues are you passionate about? And what do you want to pursue? And once you identify that, then think about what companies and organizations are in that space and just make a list of it. And then when you know those, those companies, think about what skills and experiences you have that you can contribute to those organizations. And also think about what skills you should build in order to, uh, to contribute to those companies. And I think it's really important to ask yourself how far geographically you're willing to go. Uh, and how far, if you have family, how far will your family go? Uh, you know, an adventure sounds great for a little while, but you, you may find that uh, you, you want to be closer to home. It's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to, to, to work in New York and, and uh, have a job with the international perspective. And finally, also think about how much risk you can take and how much financial sacrifice you're willing to make. Uh, I think it's, you may find that if you pursue a really socially driven uh, career opportunity, you may have to make a bit of a financial sacrifice. You know, hopefully you can make enough to, to get by, but you, you're probably not going to be making the, the tough to other consulting and, and, uh, and banking bucks. So just think about um, what, what, your, what trade offs you're willing to make. So I'll wrap up on that note and allow us to pass over to the other speakers and then um, hope to take some questions a little bit later. Thank you, Dan. Um, we are going to try um, to bring on uh, Ramil Ibrahim, who is our fellows associate with Acumen Fund. He is calling in from Kenya, and we are not sure about the sound aspect, so we're just going to give this a shot. Um, so welcome, Ramil. Hi, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. So should I just go? I think you should go. Let um I think uh, we'll trust that everyone else can hear you as well. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry for the technical difficulty, um, but thanks for bearing with me. Um and I guess uh readings from Kenya. Um so yeah, so I guess I'll just jump right in. Um so uh before I sort of go into um, what Acumen Fund does and sort of what the fellowship program is and sort of how we think about developing leaders um, and maybe even like just general advice about sort of how to conduct a job search. Um, so in terms of my background, um, so uh, at Acumen Fund, I work on leadership development. Um, so that takes the form of, uh, we have a couple of uh, leadership development programs um, that I help manage. So. We're a very, very lean team at Acumen Fund, so uh, I work on everything from sort of uh, fundraising and grant proposals to curriculum development to the design um, and program administration and things like that. Um, and sort of my background was in, um, I went to New York University um, and I, had, I graduated, uh, I got my undergraduate degree from there two years ago, um, and I was studying education, um, sociology, and uh, I had a minor in uh, social enterprise. We have a small program there. Um, and while I was there, I was doing internships mostly around um, sort of the nonprofit space, um, and I had an internship at a foundation. And sort of, uh, I was beginning to realize that sort of I became frustrated with the traditional sort of philanthropic model. Um, and so I was searching for more um, business-based approaches, market-based approaches. Um, and Acumen Fund also offered the opportunity through the fellows program to combine my passion for education with sort of my deep interest um, in social enterprise. So that's sort of how I ended up um, where I am. Um, and to, I guess, to kick off uh, and jump right into sort of what Acumen Fund does. Um, Acumen Fund, as you can see on the, on the slide, invests in sort of three different areas. One is in companies, so we invest in um, social enterprises and social entrepreneurs. We invest in leaders through our fellows programs, and that's what I primarily work on and we invest in ideas. Um, and so we think a lot of how do we um, extract insights from the field and share them with our communities. Um, and our, our model has sort of been built around um, this idea of patient capital, which was pioneered by our founder and CEO, still CEO, um, Jacqueline Novogratz. Um, her background was sort of, she started out in private banking, um, and she became dissatisfied with sort of uh, traditional market-based approaches and how they often overlook um, the bottom of the economic period and so many people are, are not served and don't have access to basic goods and services. Um, and then she said, worked at the Rockefeller Foundation and became sort of a little disenchanted with um, the lack of accountability in the philanthropic sector. So she combined the two um, and came up with this idea of patient capital, which is basically raising philanthropic dollars and um, using the flexibility of philanthropic dollars to make high-risk, long-term investments um, but really not um, 
focusing on uh, financial financial returns. Our typical returns are around um, like 0.96 to like one uh, x return, um, but really focusing on social impact. Um, so how do we impact the most lives possible? Um, and so over the last 10 years, we've um, invested in over 60 com companies um, using uh, about 70 million dollars. We've reached 86 million people, and we've created 55,000 jobs. And so when we're selecting investments, um, it's a very long sort of diligence process. Um, we have very specific criteria. Um, and in fact, one of Acumen Fund's main sort of challenges right now is actually developing pipeline and finding investments. Uh, we actually have more uh, capital than we do have investments. Um, and sort of uh, just these are sort of the, the main buckets. Um, can, we, can the company, before investing, can the company reach a million people? Um, do they have a world-class team of entrepreneurs? Um, do, can, are they self-sustaining? Are they sustainable? And um, can, they, can they impact and be sort of a, a model that, that sort of proves their concept and can be replicated? Um, we work in low-income emerging markets, so we work around the world. Uh, we have four country offices um, in Karachi, Pakistan, um, Mumbai, India, Nairobi, Kenya, where I'm right now, um, and Accra, Ghana. And we have a base office in New York where I sit most of the year. Um, and our investments, I'll just go through these sort of quickly just so we can get to sort of the, the, the main piece of the, of the presentation. Um, and we work in water and sanitation, energy, housing, agriculture, health, and education is our, is our newest portfolio. Um, and I'll just talk about one of these uh, companies because it's, it's pretty relevant to our fellows program, which I'll talk about next, which is uh, the company on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's called uh, Zakisa Healthcare Limited, or more commonly it's known as um, Dial 1298 for Ambulance, which has sort of um, pioneered the way for ambulance companies in India. Um, and so basically, um, maybe like five, ten years ago, ambulances, if you saw one, it would be carrying a dead body. It wouldn't be carrying someone to go and try to save their life at a hospital. It would only be carrying a dead body. And so that was a serious problem because if you, ha if you were seriously injured, you wouldn't be able to get to a hospital so that you could receive the treatment that you needed. So um, it was difficult for a number of reasons, um, but uh, it was very, very difficult to sort of penetrate to the bottom of the pyramid um, with ambulance services that were effective, um, yet uh, with a sustainable model. So they created a sliding scale sort of approach. So it depended on where your um, where you're going in the hospital. So let's say you were going to a private hospital and you were requiring care, um, you would have to pay a premium. Your, your ambulance bill would be a little bit more. But if you're going to a public hospital, presumably you wouldn't have that much money um, and your care would be greatly reduced or even free. Um, and I bring this example up um, just to give you an example sort of about uh, what our fellows do. Um, and so, yeah, so basically, um, it's, a, it's a fantastic company, and we invest in sort of these new models and new businesses. Um, but really, uh, investing capital is really nothing without leadership. And so, as I mentioned before, Acumen Fund, one of our main challenges right now is developing that pipeline of enterprises, which cannot be done sort of without um, investing in new leaders and new entrepreneurs to sort of drive innovations and create these um, creative models of social change. Um, and so, about Six years ago, going on seven, um, we created the Global Fellows Program to sort of address this leadership gap in the social sector. Um, so what we're really trying to do is um, create leaders in this new mold who take a balance of sort of um, the skills required um, to uh, sort of work in these very, very difficult environments, along with the will um, to um, work on some of the world's most intractable, intractable problems. Um, and so this is our sort of mission statement for the Global Fellows Program. We aim to identify and train the next generation of leaders for the emerging sector at the intersection of business and social impact. We're going to act as innovators, architects, architects, and system changers for this new sector. And our, and our leadership model is um, similar to what I was mentioning before. So on the bottom, it's people who have this, these skills, these financial and operational skills, um, to kind of drive businesses and build businesses, as well as the moral imagination piece. Um, so the ability to sort of see the world as it is and um, have the humility to sort of stick, take stock of what things look like on the ground, um, as well as the audacity to sort of dream a new world. Um, and so hopefully combined, uh, combining those sort of dreams as well as the skills 
people are able to execute against those visions and actually drive change. Um, and so the, the fellowship year um, starts with two months of training in New York. It's an interdisciplinary um, training program. Um, we have about 10 fellows a year, and they undergo um, a lot of sort of hard skills training around business and operations, negotiations, things like that, as well as softer skills around um, public speaking or storytelling. Um, and some of the trainers include Jay Powell, uh, Columbia, New York University, uh, Cambridge Leadership Associates, um, we talk with Cisco, um, and really what we try to do, what we think our value add is that we, we offer sort of a, a very integrated, very um, multidisciplinary um, kind of training program that we believe you can't really get out there at sort of like a normal MBA. Um, and then the core of the fellowship is, is a field placement. And so this is a picture of Chicago Fujita, who actually worked at 1298, that company that I was talking about before. And she was working at, working on sort of um, um, expanding the company. So in the last few years, they've gone from a fleet of 35 ambulances to now they're almost at 600. Um, and a big part of um, Chicago's job was sort of creating standard operating procedures and sort of manuals and, and guidelines for uh, and blueprints for how do you exactly do expand in new regions. And so she worked a lot in Rajasthan, um, and that was the team that she led in Rajasthan. Um, so in the picture with her, drivers, um, call center, call phone operators, and things like that. And that's a nine-month field placement where you work sort of shoulder to shoulder with um, entrepreneurs. Um, and then at the end of the fellowship year, you return to New York for one month with the end um, to sort of undergo debrief um, and career plan for the next step. Um, and that's sort of the, the gist of the one-year program. And after that one-year program, um, our fellows go on to um, we're seeing they're, they're becoming the leaders that we hope to create. 85% of our alumni are continuing to play leadership roles in the social sector, and 100% are in leadership roles regardless of which sector they're in. Um, and sort of they play a number of roles in terms of um, on the bottom left is Jawad Aslam, who um, we placed him in Pakistan at a housing development company, um, and he went on to become a social entrepreneur himself um, to kind of replicate that model in a different location in Pakistan. Jocelyn Wyatt is the executive director of IDEO.org, so she's an entrepreneur, sort of. Um, so she's someone that's driving a uh, kind of a social responsibility arm um, and leadership development program within the for-profit IDEO, which is a design firm. Um, and George Sudakar is on the top right, um, and he's sort of been a He's a community leader in his community um, and has uh, led uh, groups and uh, book clubs uh, and, uh, in Kibera, which is uh, one of the largest clubs in Africa, and um, helping them to self-organize self and um, run TEDx uh, in the slums. And so the fellows are occupying, these are just some other organizations that they're, that they're represented at. Um, Post-fellowship, I'm just going to go through, through these sort of kind of quickly. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned the last stat. Um, many sort of have uh, have plans to start a social enterprise. Um, and so the application requirements, if you are interested in applying to the fellows program, what we look for is about three to seven years of work experience, um, a track record of leadership and management and responsibilities, and emerging experience in emerging markets. Um, so whether that means international experience or maybe you grew up um, and worked your whole life in sort of an emerging market setting. Um, that's sort of how that plays out. Um, and then a graduate degree is preferred, so um, if you have an MBA, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the gold standard that we sort of look for. And then a, a strong passion and commitment for the social sector. So whether that means you were a Peace Corps volunteer at one point in your life, or you um, started a, uh, a social responsibility initiative at your job, um, that's the form that that would take. Um, and to give you a sense of the sort of application um, like flow, we typically get a, a thousand applications, is how many we got last year. Um, so online applications, we got a thousand, and then we dwindled that down to a pool of about 125, which we phone interviewed, and then in person we met about 60, and then we've just extended offers to 12 people for this, this current class. And so um, the next time you can apply is October 2012, so the end of this year, um, if you were interested in starting in September of 2013. Um, yeah, and sort of to give you, <laughs> sorry about this, to give you a sense of where our applications come from, um, they typically come, there's a broad spectrum of where they come from, um, all over the world, plenty from Asia and Africa, um, as well as uh, sort of the West, 
Um, education level varies. I think I'll, I'll gloss over these pretty quickly. Um, this is on our website. Um, these are just examples of past fellows. Um, so sort of uh, a big uh, gain, a big value add that we see our fellowship doing is being able to place people from one nationality in one context and place them in another. So people from the like, Chicago who I mentioned before, she was from Japan and she was placed in India. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this right now because I'm not sure that this is still relevant. And, um, uh, do you, can you give me a sense of how much time I have left? Um, <clears throat> I think you can, yeah, you can follow up in the next few minutes. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and so that's basically the, the presentation um, that I had prepared. And um, I guess uh, right now the reason I'm in Nairobi is because we bring the fellows back together every year for sort of a, a mid-year training program. Um, and something that's on their mind right now is, is what I'm assuming is very much at the front of your minds as well, which is um, what am I going to do um, after the fellowship? They have about five months left in their fellowship, and so now they're really starting to um, kick into gear and think about next steps. Um, and some of the things that we've um, kind of been focusing on to help them think about next steps have been around sort of self-awareness. So some people, um, some people sort of have dreams of being an entrepreneur, but um, having the self-awareness to uh, understand that may maybe, maybe for the next maybe five years or ten, or 10 years or something, maybe you're going to work with entrepreneurs and until you build up the skills to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur yourself. Um, taking stock of sort of what was your experience before you started sort of your, your MBA or your fellowship um, and knowing sort of how your previous experiences interact with what experiences you've recently acquired. Um, other things are uh, big versus small. So do you see yourself going into a big organization or do you want to sort of be at a start in a startup environment um, and sort of getting your hands dirty? Um, other things are sort of sector clarity. So thinking about um, do I want to be in education? Do I want to um, be in energy? Um, other things are geography or do I want to be a generalist or do I want to be a, a specialist and be a um, subject matter expert? Um, or do you want to be in sort of like the development space or uh, working in foundations and NGOs or do you want to be in the commercial space? Um, and so these are the sorts of things that they're thinking about now um, and sort of tracing patterns in their life and thinking about really what, what, is sort of, what are some of their sort of career anchors and what has um, kept them most satisfied throughout their lives um, because a lot of people sort of come to this sector because they've been dissatisfied um, in previous experiences. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so I guess just generally I think um, one of the key pieces in this as well and, um, is uh, trying to get clarity and sort of taking a, taking a long time to sort of reflect about what are some of the things um, that you want to get out of your career and sort of what kinds of impacts you want to have eventually, um, as well as taking a hard look at your, your own background and your own experiences and seeing how best you can sort of fit into the overall landscape of social change if that's something that you, you sort of want to do. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's all, everything that I sort of had to say and bring to the table. Um, and. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in applying to the fellows program or if you're just interested to sort of chat offline, um, really, really interested, uh, I'm very open to sort of talk about either. Um, so yeah, so thanks. Good. Thank you so much, Ramil. Okay, uh, last but not least, um, we have Tom Kanger, Director for Venture Philanthropy, who has an extensive background in uh, the financial services, previously with BMW in Germany and the UK. And he has uh, also successfully transferred those skills to make a difference. Welcome, Tom. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome from Zurich, um, Switzerland. I want to jump into um, the presentation immediately. So the question is, can MBA change the world? And actually, I think I personally meet, uh, met 52 of them and that um, went on an alternative career path uh, to, to contribute with, her profession, with their professional skills uh, to, to make a positive impact. And um, I would like to introduce you to one of them uh, more closely today. And yes, uh, it's me actually. So I uh, studied computer science and I worked um, 10 years uh, for BMW and Compaq in different uh, functions like uh, 
project management and I was a team leader for IT architects and later on uh, managed a call center. So I had quite a lot of um, uh, experience in, in, in managing projects and managing teams. Uh, but then after 10 years, I kind of like came to the point where I thought, um, is that the right career path that I'm on? Is that the, the, the type of um, profession that I'm looking for that will be meaningful to me? So I thought, okay, so looking back in my career when I'm older, like what happened when I continued to work at BMW, which I still think is an uh, amazing company? Um, but probably I would have contributed to that. Uh, and we all kind of like used to traffic jams, but still not like very appealing to me to, um, you know, to continue working towards that. So um, I started researching and I, I tried to find things that um, might be more meaningful to me. So um, then I asked myself the question, how would it feel if I would support gender equality and quality education for girls in India, for example. Or how would it feel to support subsistence farmers in Africa to increase their income to secure their lives, families, livelihood? And I thought, wow, that's, that's a lot more appealing to me. I, I think that's how I want to use my skills. Uh, I want to really make a difference. but. After I, I had this clearance in my mind, I had the next big question um, in front of my head. So I thought, okay, how? Where do I start? Like, how can I engage? How can I use my professional skills to make a, a, to make a difference? And then, more coincidentally at that time, I uh, learned about LGT Venture Philanthropy. And then they said that they strive to narrow the, the gap uh, between uh, the rich and the poor by uh, investing into social and environmental organizations that increase the quality of life of less advantaged people. And I thought, okay, that sounds interesting. So um, I continued talking to those guys at that time to understand the model a, a, a bit better. So LGT Venture Philanthropy um, tries to maximize the social impact of young and strongly growing social ventures in developing and emerging countries. And LGTVP is doing this by providing financial capital, so investments or donations, is providing social capital, which is exposure to networks and link people up with others that could help, and also with intellectual capital, which is the mentoring program of the LGTVP investment managers and also a capacity building program that is called ICAT that we will look into further during the presentation. But before we jump into ICAT, um, the scale of LGTVP's operation right now is, um, is quite impressive, I think. Uh, we um, are working all over the world, Latin America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, um, and China. And we um, currently invested um, into 18 social ventures, and those social ventures are working in the field of education, health, nutrition, renewable energy, etc., and reaching um, about six million people, um, six million less advantaged people. Um, they have like an, an international uh, presence of their team, so in total there are 18 people working for LGDVP, and most of those people are actually coming from the different regions and working there and living there. So I thought, okay, that might be an opportunity so, uh, for me to actually change my career. So um, I looked further into this opportunity of the iKids program. So what is the iKids program all about? And then they explained to me, okay, there's like two sides. On the one hand, you have like social ventures out there they have really innovative solutions to address societal problems, but they lack professional know-how and resources to really grow their impact, to really scale their organizations. And then on the other hand, you have um, professionals like me that want to change their careers and want to make a difference, but don't know how to start, where to start. So, and actually the ICATS program is combining the two. It's linking them, it's bridging, it's bridging them up. So the ICATS program provides opportunities for professionals to create a significant positive impact 
by applying the business skills to strengthen the organizational capacity in the organizations of the LG TVP portfolio. And ICATS uh, is not an Apple spin-off, um, it's actually the abbreviation for Impact Catalyst. So, how does an, an ICATS engagement um, look like? It's a, a 3 to 12 month, always temporary engagement on site and full time um, with organizations that are based around the world. The host organizations are always organizations of the LGTVP portfolio, can be for-profit, can be non-profit, and all of them have ambitious targets to scale their impact. That's why LGTVP is invested into them. Typical roles of ICATS, it's like typical business functions like business development, financial analysis, strategy, sales and marketing, etc. The ICATS program is not paying a salary, but it's covering local living costs and the health insurance and, and travel. So, in the special, this, I think what's really special about the program is that the host organizations, that there's a really close relationship between the capacity building program and the organizations because the capacity program, building program, is part of the whole investment strategy of LGT Venture Philanthropy. So we know the organizations very well. We have a very good relationship with them. We are very keen from an LGTVP point of view that the contribution an ICAT makes is really growing and building up the organization's capacity because that will ultimately help them to increase their impact and to become more efficient with what they do. There is also like a, a mentorship involved. Uh, that the, I, the LGTVP investment managers that work closely with the organizations on the ground will provide mentoring to ICATS. So there is like this, um, this network between the local organization, the ICAT, and the LGTVP investment manager that all together um, work towards making the most out of this uh, capacity building engagement. So looking back, when that was introduced to me, I thought, wow, that sounds really uh, what I'm looking for. I can use my professional skills. It's a, a, a setup where I feel that it's really professional and I can really use my skills to make a difference. So I had to make a decision and so everything was lined up. I, I was certain I want to do this. I had a program that I could um, put, like apply for. And now it was time to make um, the decision to quit my job at BMW, tell my friends and family that I'm leaving and going on an ICATS engagement. And that was actually quite tough. I mean, it was in the middle of the economic downturn in uh, 2008, late 2008, giving up a good job at BMW. It was tough. But I actually followed my inner calling, my motivation to make a difference. And I quit. I did it. And um, I can already say I never regretted one second. I, I joined the ICATS program in 2011, I, in 2009, sorry. And I went um, as a chief project manager to a social enterprise incubator in South Africa. So my, my aim was to transfer my management skills to strengthen the organizational capacity of the organization to grow their impact. A concrete in concrete terms, that meant that I created like systems and processes for project management. I trained the project manager that worked with the incubates to become more efficient in, um, in managing the incubates, managing the project. I also helped the organization to establish the middle management layer, like set up clear roles and responsibilities, job descriptions, governance uh, structures, reporting, etc. So with that contribution, I really helped the organization to become stronger and, um, and achieve more, more impact. And obviously, um, the LGTVP team was, um, was satisfied with the work that I did. And uh, I was very happy and very lucky when they told me about like two-thirds after my fellowship that they are interested in hiring me for permanent position as the COO and director of the ICAS program of LGT Venture Philanthropy Giving Service. So um, that's a bit how I actually went on my alternative career path. And what did I learn? I mean, 
an ICATS engagement or like an Acumen Fellowship or working um, for Dahlberg offers you both professional as well as personal growth. Um, for me professionally, it was really great after coming from a big corporation like BMW to work uh, with the senior management uh, in startup like um, social enterprise, learning about how uh, business models work at the base of the pyramid. I think it was also very interesting for me to learn to work with various cost resources, so very little money, very little stuff. Um, um, so that was interesting to motivate people without non-financial returns. So I did a couple of um, professional learnings um, that I made and that obviously are um, learning fields for everyone who is um, joining an iKids engagement. Personally, I think I definitely learned to deal with the unknown. I mean, um, there was a lot of unknown things before I, I started that and it felt good or it still feels good to know that, to cope, be able to cope with that. Um, the personal satisfaction to create positive change is amazing. So for me, like waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, I don't want to go to work today, doesn't exist anymore doesn't exist anymore and that's one of the greatest achievements of my whole alternative career that I really feel inspired by what I do. I go to work with a lot of energy every day, every single day and that's like a wonderful um, achievement for me personally and I'm very thankful um, to the iKids program, to LGTVP that they offered this career switch to me. So what does the iKids program need? A bit similar to what um, uh, acumen and 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 Albert needs it's basically well very well educated people with international work experience a minimum of two years of work experience even if we uh, mostly hire people uh, or select people to the fellowship program with five five years plus work experience because you work in a very challenging environment you have to build up capacity which means changing often things in the organization to make things more structured, uh, more process oriented. So there's also a lot of sensitivity that is needed and that's why you have to be strongly cost driven, otherwise it won't work. So it's very strong cost driven to make a difference in order to yeah, go through this um, very um, rewarding um, experience. So here you see Nadine. Nadine uh, worked as an ICAT fellow last year uh, with Educate Girls in India. She has a marketing background and she worked with Educate Girls uh, as a PR and communication strategist and helped the organization to um, have a, like a, a very clear message, uh, update the, um, the website, uh, the communication material, presentations, fundraising. So she really helped the whole communication strategy within Educate Girls to more clearly communicate to the target group what they are all about, how they differentiate from other organizations and how they create the impact and why others should support them. And that has like a tremendous value to the organization. We are very thankful that Nadine spent a year uh, in the field. How can you engage? You basically have two options. One option is um, the ICATS fellowship program, which is like a fixed term program. It's always 11 months uh, on site full time, always starts in February till December. The application period for the next fellowship is in June, July this year, so in, in, in two months it starts. Um, we have a four day orientation workshop in Switzerland where all fellows uh, fly in in order to have intercultural training to form. Um, the cohort um, to connect with each other, to work on case studies of previous ICATs. So, uh, and also throughout the 11 months you have a professional mentoring from one of our local team members of the LGTBT team. Or if you can't go on an 11 month uh, fellowship program, there's what we call the ICATs consultants, which is a 3 to 12 month engagement um, also on site full time. Flexible start date, apply whenever the uh, opportunities are posted. And how can you actually apply? You can go to the website, we have a web platform, it's called www.icatsprogram.com. You have to register, fill in your personal data and your availability, and when you fulfill the basic requirements to join the program, you will be accepted to the pool. And once you are a member of the ICATS pool, 
you can apply online to available positions and then go through the selection process. As I mentioned, the next fellowship program starts in February 2013 and applications are open in June, July this year. Even if there are no opportunities on the platform, just feel free to connect with us and uh, tell us your availability and we can always um, reach out to the organization and find out uh, if there's something um, suitable for you. Hey, Tom. So, yes. I'm just, just to know, we're, we're running short on time. I hope uh, all of you can um, stay with us a little longer because we are going to ask some questions of our panelists, but uh, just a heads up, Tom. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. I, I, sorry, Dan, I stole your, uh, um, <laughs> your slide questions to ask yourself because I find it's a really good um, really good slide so I quickly integrated it into my presentation as well I think they're all valid for us as well um, so far 50 52 ICATS have been uh, nominated to the program we are running the program since 2008 and um, you can see like I'm not going through that uh, like the business schools or the universities and um, the ICATS usually come from or like the companies that they work for there are a couple of testimonials uh, from previous ICATS as well as from Reese Fernandez, the CEO of an organization that we support on the Philippines. It's called Rex Riches. And here you can see a couple of, of like examples of what ICATS do after their engagement. So Verena, for example, she joined BMW again after her fellowship last year and is now working in the sustainability strategy management department. So I think that she will uh, even like returning back to the private sector will use her skills and her experience to work hard within the BMW environment organization to um, make the whole organization, the whole um, corporate more sustainable. So you don't even have to stay in the social sector to create positive impact. Even if you contribute to corporates to, to make them more sustainable, to make them creative and innovative, how they how they can provide products and services that are sustainable, I think you will have a great impact in this world. So I'm not running through all of those examples. You can read them on your own later. Uh, and please connect with me. Um, here's my email address, my phone number. We have an iCats blog, um, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. Please uh, <laughs> connect with us and, um, and find out more about previous iCats engagements, previous experiences, and um, how you can potentially join the program very soon. So thanks a lot, and um, I'm very interested about your your questions. Thank you so much. Um, we had a couple of questions, and uh, for the next few moments, if anybody has additional ones, feel free to post those. Um, one specific one to Dan Zook. Um, are you still with us, Dan? Is Dan still with us? Yeah, I'm here. I think I was on mute. I'm, I'm still here. Hi, that's okay. Um, okay, so the question is, how are your new consultants, example from management consulting firms, um, without formal education and development studies um, or extensive experience in the, that work, um, supported to build the knowledge relevant to your set of clients and projects? In other words, how do they quickly adapt to those contexts? Um, and are your applicants expected to know a great deal about that sector prior to coming to work with you? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we, you know, we get a range of, of people who come in. Some people have more experience on the, uh, on the international development side, and some people have more experience on the consulting side. Our, our ideal candidate has both, right? But you can't always get, get that. Um, you know, as a consultant, what you do is you learn stuff really fast. You know, drinking from the fire hose every time you join a new project, and we have a whole wealth of information and and people in our organization who do that. So if, if people don't have deep experience, we just expect them to, to leverage the resources within our organization to talk to the other partners, to use our internal database and find out and learn really fast and, and just get up to speed so that they can contribute. Okay. Um, we had another question that I think um, perhaps I have noticed many students have and also career consultants have, which is, um, the question of ROI on the MBA, uh, what is your take on how long it would take for a student, uh, say, going through, you know, the, the internships that might not pay as well and also the, um, 
you know, engagement in, in nonprofits and so forth. What is your experience with that, or how do you personally see balancing those values of, um, you know, the, the pay that, that MBAs often hope for to pay off those loans versus really the other value set that drives them into these alternative careers? That, that one's, I guess, for anybody, but let me start with you, Tom. Very difficult question to answer. I mean, <laughs> we, we run the program since three years, so um, we, and we are not following up in terms of like um, salaries, etc., like how quickly people actually are able to, um, to uh, make up for that. But I personally think that for me, speaking for me, I now earn a lot less than I did with BMW, but for me, having like an inspiring job is also a kind of a pay. It's like a non-financial pay, but it's like an emotional salary. And uh, I think if people really want to move into this, um, into this space, that this is a very important factor that you might not earn um, the biggest buck in the world, um, but you will have a job that you every day um, love and you feel you make a positive contribution for your life for the life of your children and maybe for the future generation. And I think that's invaluable and they can't be measured uh, in dollars. However, I understand that a lot of MBA students have the pressure to pay back uh, their loans and that's often um, actually a deal breaker with the ICATS program that people first go on, um, on a private sector job to earn uh, money to pay back their, their loans and then uh, join us at a later stage of their career. Good, which also fulfills some of the requirements we, we heard from all of you exactly. as well. Yeah, I, would just, I would just add to that that it's, uh, we, get the, we face a similar issue with, with, with candidates as well. And uh, so some people, you know, you can take a long-term view. You can go off and, and pay down your loans. I went and worked in the Middle East, right? You don't have to pay taxes in the Middle East. So that helps with paying down my loans. Uh, and then, you know, you take a long-term perspective and, and you can come back with those skills and experiences and pursue something you're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So, Ramil, you're, you're at the young stage um, of your career, but uh, how do you see that from your point of view? Unfortunately, we have lost Ramil, so if there are any questions okay. specifically for the Acumen Fund, we can. I will be sending out emails um, of the panelists, and they can send it to him directly. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, wonderful. Thank you for joining us, everyone. It's now 11.34. Um, if there are more questions, we will be sending out the, the emails for the panelists as well as the moderator. Um, the recording and the presentation will be mailed out uh, by email um, and will be available online. You can share it with your fellow students um, and your colleagues. So, Phyllis, if you would like to go ahead and, and wrap up the session, I will go ahead and end the, end the webinar. Sure. Um, well, I think that, you know, we heard uh, quite a few great tips here. I think um, from my view as a career consultant, um, the takeaways are think interdisciplinary. I think as you heard, um, Ramil, he started in education and sociology but brought that to social enterprise. Dan um, had a background in technology and finance and brought that to an international um, world of strategy and communications and emerging markets. I think um, you know, what they all said, and I loved it that you were stealing slides from each other, <laughs> is uh, own your mission. Uh, be, be thoughtful up front. Um, you're putting in a lot of investment in your MBA, so, uh, so decide as if you are the CEO of your career, what is your mission, and then seek um, internships specifically there, build the transferable skills. Leadership development programs can be very helpful in some of the companies where you can kind of grow a lot of skills and understand how they intersect. Um, and know that many companies are in the, the form of change, so you can rise up and perhaps create your career within a company as they learn to figure out issues of sustainability and so forth. Another, I think, uh, takeaway is to think collaboration rather than traditional competition. What we heard was uh, resource sharing, public-private partnerships, finding the win-win-win between the profit, social, and environmental values. Maybe some trade-offs, but, um, you know, I think that uh, the, the rewards are great. And over time, I mean, everyone's careers, <laughs> my own included, um, you know, you're, you're going to navigate and, um, and make those trade-offs no matter what career you walk into. So 
Um, so I think that it is always a balancing act as we as we manage work and life um, overall. I think um, finding your partners is key within those partnerships. Um, reach out to people doing already maybe more senior in those careers than you are, and and try at some level to 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 build what I call the board of advisors or or build mentor relationships. Um, and finally, I think uh, lead in the gap. You are the next generation leaders. Look where the trends are going. Understand what's, what the issues are and seek to innovate. Look for your opportunities in startups, new product development. Um, as I mentioned, you know, new departments emerging that are going to need talent. Um, and as Dan recommended, uh, read, research, uh, network, and so forth. Um, be willing to travel, but consider you know, the, the short-term and long-term aspects of that. There are a number of books that I will encourage you to, to check out. There are such ones as um, Sustainability by Design, um, Blessed Unrest uh, by Paul Hawken. Um, there's even a video online. Um, you might want to look at TED Talks and some of those other things. Um, there are some new organizations emerging, one of which um, is called Rework, which is specifically receiving applications um, and, and matching those with um, um, more non-traditional organizations. Uh, for those of you interested in the environment, Green Careers, Central Green Careers, um, a lot of articles. And so as you do your discovery, you're going to find yourself on that journey. So, um, and then, of course, uh, at each one of your MBA schools has a career office, so be sure to go visit them. And, um, but, but, but do what they suggest, um, owning your mission yourself, because that, you're the creator. And, um, and you're the next generation leadership. So thanks for being here as part of that investment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ramil, Dan, Tom, and Phyllis. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today.